Hi, I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to welcome you once again to our Sunday service here at Disciples of Faith Global Outreach, where we're reaching the world one share at a time. I'm certainly glad to have you with us. We've got some serious business to take care of today. Got some really, really powerful things to unpack. You know, I was going to go in another direction this Sunday, but in our Bible study, we were dealing with the church at Smyrna and we didn't get a chance to finish it. So my goal today is to really finish up the end of that uh, by ministering those very same final words that are going to come from Revelation chapter 2. Uh, starting at verse number 10 through 11. Glad to have you with us. Glad that those that are going to be coming on are, are, are with us. Um, and listen, don't hesitate to start a watch party, uh, you know, where, wherever you are. To, so because we want as many people as possible to be able to eat at this table, which is a the, the free but true divine word of God. It's a gift that God has given unto the earth. So we want to take advantage of this time that's been allotted for us to come together and to sit at the feet of the Lord, to receive that good portion that cannot be taken away. And you know, and the Bible says that, you know, there's none good but God. So if we're getting a good portion, we're getting the portion that God has actually sanctified for us, that is going to be meat for us, that even is that very same thing that God talked about, where he says, man can't live by bread alone, but, but, but he can by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He can't live by bread alone, but he can. You know, when you look at that, it says, but, which means that, you know, it's a, it's a transitional phrase that, that actually changes or is, is actually in some cases a contrast to the original. You can actually live by the word of God. You can survive, but you can also live, which is the opposite of death. You will thwart death by the word of God. So let's take a look at the word once again that's coming in the book of Revelations, chapter number two. I'm gonna be starting at verse number 10, ending at verse number 11, just two verses. We're gonna get directly into prayer. Then we're gonna start unpacking. So, but I don't want you to forget, part of what we do here at Disciples of Faith is that our goal is to share the gospel. And we do that when we reach this world uh, is by sharing this gospel one share at a time. So we share it by simply pressing that share button. I'm going to ask you to do that today. We're certainly getting better with that. And I certainly appreciate everybody that is, uh, that, that, you, that, you know, has been helping us in this mission. And you can be a part of that too by today doing that very same thing. I'm going to be reading once again, the book of Revelation chapter two, verse number 10, verse number 11. We're going to pray and then we're going to get directly into the word. How you doing, mom? All right, let's read. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you right now for divine revelation for your word. God, we just thank you right now for servants that are going out all over the world this day. God, preaching and ministering your gospel, not just today, but God, each and every day. We thank you right now that you're sending forth laborers out into the vineyard because it was proclaimed that the harvest is actually plentiful, but the labors are few. So God, we thank you right now for the stirring up of all the labors for the equipping of the saints. You gave some apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists for this very purpose that they would be able to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So God, we thank you for all the workmen that are assembled today. All the, those that are gonna hear this word, they're gonna hear word from you all over the world. And God, we pray right now for divine effectiveness that we would not only just be hearers, but effective doers of this word. So we bless you, we thank you right now in Jesus' name, amen. Now, taking a look here at the church at Smyrna, you know, we, one of the things we find out is we understand that John is getting this, uh, this revelation uh, from the uh, Isle of Patmos, directly from Jesus. He is in this uh, indeterminate sentence, um, and actually it's a death sentence. You know, in, in reality, it is like our secure housing units today, uh, you know, where there is an absolute confinement. John has no company on this island. Uh, the, the food is spare. There are no, uh, there's no housing there, so he's responsible for even finding his own housing. And people that are on the Isle of Patmos are there to just disappear. The point of putting them out there away from society is to make sure that they can no longer cause any disruption, which tells us that John was causing a stir where he was, that the reality is the power of God was working in him 
and th there was such growth in him that the only way they could get rid of him was by getting him in a place where the words that he spoke could no longer in their in their mindset have any more impact on society and I want you to see that and hear that because that's the enemy's attack today to try to marginalize and ostracize and, and to try to literally minim minimalize the, the word of God in, in, in today and to literally miniaturize some of the people that God has actually placed in position today to, draw, to, to blow a trumpet uh, concerning the gospel. But understand this, you can't minimize what God has already maximized. There's absolutely no way to do that. So even on the Isle of Patmos, where you know John is, is away from everybody, he's not away from the spirit of God. He's not away from Jesus. And Jesus comes and finds him and begins to tell him uh, some things concerning the churches that, that's relevant for us today. Now, as you begin to look at the church at Smyrna, Jesus talks about the fact that he understands their condition. And he knows all of those conditions, every condition that they're in. He knows that they're experiencing poverty. He knows that they're experiencing tribulation. He knows that they're working for him under the most adverse conditions that you could really have, that they couldn't, they had not seen this kind of persecution in their lives ever. They hadn't seen it against any other people. So they were fighting persecution from the greater world and even fights from what was in their, their, their community. So, it, I mean, it was up close and personal. And Jesus comes and he says to them, you know, I know all these things that are happening. I know your works. He tells them that he sees them as faithful. But then he comes and says, listen, I don't want you to fear any of the things which are you are about to suffer. He, so he tells them that they're going to encounter some suffering. They're going to encounter imprisonment. They're going to encounter death. He says the devil is actually behind all of these things and, and, and behind, behind all the treatment that they're going to receive. But Jesus still comes and he says, but I don't want you to fear. Now, in Jesus' earthly ministry, he tells us clearly, he says, don't fear those that can only kill the body, right? And, and that's really important. He says they have some power to kill the body. But he says, but fear him that can kill both body and soul in hell. That's what he says. And he then he reminds his people that the father's eye is on the sparrow, right? And then he says, but we are valued much more than the, than the sparrow. So he says, listen. I don't want you to operate in any kind of slavish fear. I don't want you to operate in a spirit of fear. Now, you know, when the Lord says don't fear, he's dealing with this spirit of fear that's sent by the enemy to thwart the word of God. It's not a fear of dogs and it's not a fear of heights, you know, because some of those things may keep you safe. And some of those things are simply natural things that are in the flesh. But Jesus is now saying, this is not just fleshly spear, fear rather. This is a spirit of fear that is designed by the enemy. Because remember, who does he tell us is the instigator here? He says the devil is the one that's going to be behind what you're going through right now. People are going to be an instrument used by the enemy to, to persecute you, but the enemy is actually behind this, and his weapons are going to be the same. He's going to bring about fear to try to paralyze you. He's going to offer up fear as a cocoon because fear has a tendency to work directly against reasoning, and fear has a tendency to work directly against the reasoning of God. Should I even do this? Is it even worth it? You know, is, is there confidence? Compromise. You know, couldn't I just say it? Listen, what kind of things are going to happen? Jesus says they're going to undergo persecution and it's going to come from the enemy who comes to kill, steal and destroy. So there's going to be beatings. There's going to be imprisonment. There's going to be death. There's going to be a confiscation of goods. Economically, they're going to be tattered and death itself in all of its forms, in all of its shapes, they're going to have to deal with this. And here's what he says. You, these are things you're going to suffer. He doesn't say that there's a way out. He doesn't say begin to pray that there's some way to remove these things. He says these things are going to happen and I want you to be prepared to stand against them. The Lord begins to tell them of some things that are going to happen and he has no 
exit plan. It, it, so, you know, when you recognize there's no exit plan, we are in the plan. The reality is that God says, well, listen, when the enemy persecutes you, you know, the Lord will create a way of escape from sin, right? When, when there's sin, he says he will make a way of escape for sin. But what happens when sin happens against you, but the Lord does not create a way of escape? When he says, I create a way of escape so you can get out of sin, he doesn't say, I create a way of escape so you can get out of persecution when persecution is a part of the plan. When persecution is a part of his design for your life. He's telling the children of Smyrna, don't play, pray your way out of this. There's no way out of this. My design here is to do something, is to show you off. So the Lord comes and says, well, listen. Satan is the one who's going to throw you into prison. He's the one that's instigating uh, the, the, the enemies that you have. It is Satan that's directly opposed to the spreading of the gospel. It's Satan that's the one that's going to try to prevent you from being who I've called you to be. He's going to try to deter you from preaching the gospel and ministering the gospel. Satan is going to create in society seasons. Why the, that's why the Lord says, preach the word. Be instant, in season or out of season, not spring, winter, summer, or fall. I'm talking about seasons of popularity, seasons of when, when it's good, when everybody wants to hear, but also seasons where nobody cares, where it might get you in trouble to be obedient to God. And the, the Lord says, I recognize the trouble that is going to result in your obedience. Stand. Do it anyway. Listen, change has happened all around our world with people who have stood with the knowledge of the consequences that come from standing. Listen, they're voting. There are people in our country right now that are able to vote because somebody knew dogs were still going to bite us, that we were going to stand anyhow. We knew the, know the consequences. There's no way around it. The only other option is to turn around and go back. But if the mindset is to go forward, there's going to be a celebration of this pain. The, the reality, there's a plan and a purpose for this pain. He says, and the Lord said this, he says, I, I'm, I, the enemy is going to throw you into prison. Some of you all are going to be thrown into prison, but that you may be, that you may be tested. Now, let, let's understand that because that's really important because, he, you know, it, I mean, if this is an attack from the enemy, then shouldn't we be able to gather together and touch and agree? I mean, if this is the enemy coming to attack us, shouldn't we be able to bind and loose? Shouldn't this be a position where we just rebuke the enemy and then walk right through knowing that the word of God is already there? But here's what the Lord says. The Lord is coming and saying, no, 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 I'm allowing it. This, this attack that's happening is it, it, coming because I, it's part of my plan. This is sanctioned testing. The reality is we look and say, God, is this from you? And the Lord said, yeah, oh, let, let, let him through. This is testing. Wait a minute, this is Goliath. Can this be you? Oh, no, this is this is testing. Because the reality is I'm testing David and exposing David and proving David all at the same time. The testing of David is going to be proven on the field. And the exposure of who he is can only happen in the field. He thinks he is who he is when he's dealing with the sheep. But he knows he is who he is when it manifests in front of Goliath. That Goliath has no idea who David is and that can't be manifested unless it's on the field of persecution. He's bigger than you. It, it looks like he, he's got greater armament than you. You've got no support behind you. Everybody around you is scared. It seems like you're the only one. And God says, lights, camera, action, you are on. This is sanctioned testing. Listen, God is talking about the purification of the, this church. He's looking at Smyrna and saying, listen, you're a witness to me based upon what you're going through right now. Listen, the, the real challenge is, can I heap more on you? Can I put more on? I Listen, you know what? Under your conditions, there have been some other people that have been able to witness under those conditions. In the secular, natural world, there are people who have held on to a cause just like you have up to this point. But listen, let me take you to a, a, a point past that point where, you know, everybody knows that you give up there. Listen, let me let me put you take you past a point where everybody knows it's time to give up. Job was at that very same point where even now his wife having gone through all these other things comes and says listen 
Nobody's gonna be mad at you if you if you put up the white flag. Nobody's gonna be mad at you if you give in now. I don't even think God's gonna be mad at you. Matter of fact, God may not even be with you. Look at what you're going through. Why don't you just curse God and die? His friends were surrounding him and saying, there had to be something that you're doing wrong. When everybody falls off, when nobody else is standing and I'm the only one that seems like I'm standing by myself, God comes and says, I need to take you to that point right there where, the, where everybody would say, it's okay to give up now. It's okay to fall apart. It's okay to break down. That's only natural. After all you suffered, after they died, you lost this. You know, you got that diagnosis there. You had to go through that. You've lost so much stuff. It's okay not to praise him. It's okay not to be okay. But God knew something about Smyrna that fire brings about fire. He knew that these were fire walkers. He knew that these were people that could handle a, a licking, I mean, a licking and keep on ticking. He knew that the reality is that these were people that had been forged in a fire so they were made for fire so when the enemy brought fire it would simply illuminate them and not consume them i hope somebody's getting this right now that the reality is that there's some fires that have come in your life that god is saying no no, no don't put that out that's coming to expose you who you are and the power that's in you has been in dark in the dark nobody knows you nobody knows what's in you i'm gonna show you off to listen doesn't the Lord come and tell them that they're rich and listen here he's what he's doing right now he's burning off all the paper he's burning off the boat uh, and, and literally exposing the gift y'all got standing power listen I want to read something to you in, in, in first Peter chapter 1 verses 6 to 7 here's what it says wherein you greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be you're in heaviness through manifold temptations but that the trial of your faith being more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Listen, the Lord is saying, I will allow the attack so that you could be exposed. Listen, that the trying of your faith, that the proving of your faith, God is coming and saying, I'm telling you that you're already rich. So the reality is that he's not coming and saying, I need to know whether you really have it or not. No, the Lord is saying, you need to know that you have it. The world needs to know that you have it. You are the light of the world. I'm coming to light you up. Does it matter how I do it? Listen, we would love to be lit up by God. But what happens when God says, I'm going to let Satan do it? I'm gonna let him. I'm gonna let him do it. He has no idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him do it. Listen, salvation could come through God's plan without Satan coming to try to attack at all. But do you realize that it's Jesus who is is God the Father who comes and says, "I'm gonna let Satan do it. I'm gonna let Satan bring death on, on my son." And because from this death comes a resurrection, so I'm gonna let Satan do it. So the reality is that God is allowing some of us to be lit by satan satan is bringing this persecution and god is saying when he brings fire he has no idea that it's only going to perfectly display who you are it, it's only going to perfectly display exactly who you are and it shows you who you are listen the Christians in Smyrna, they were going to be tested. And listen, this was going to happen. And God is testing us today. He's interested in doing that very same thing. Now, we all may not go through the same thing they go through in Smyrna. We may not all have that same opportunity to be a martyr. And, and sadly enough, many believers are trying to get around it. You know, part of our, our whole role is self-preservation. We are trying to get away from this and don't realize that God is saying, listen, the, the, the reality here is that the test it's already passed. I'm not telling you that you're going to have a test. I'm telling you that you're going to pass the test. That's the reality here. And the Lord says, listen, and you're going to have tribulation 10 days. Now, when you begin to look at that, that's really important because the Lord is not, this is not just a matter of whether that, you know, it's going to be 10 specific days because there's some belief here that the, and, and it's a Greek phrase that's also used. That means a limited time. God's hand is even on the trial. The Lord says, listen, I'm going to limit the trial. What you got to know and what you got to understand is that if Satan had his way, 
there would never be an end to your trial. If Satan had his way, there would never be a limit placed on what he could do. But do you understand the Lord is saying there's going to be a period of time that I'm going to allow Satan to do what he desires to do, right? I'm going to let him try it. Because when he says, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. It doesn't mean that they're not going to throw rocks against the wall. He says, listen, I'm going to let them try it. Because listen, every now and then, you know, in order for you to kind of brag about the fact that your walls are impenetrable. You know, when you look at thick walls, you know, in, in ancient Troy, if you look at thick walls in ancient Jerusalem, in, in Babylon, if you look at thick walls, even today in fortresses that are built. They are able to attest to the fact that there are thick walls and those walls are impenetrable by the fact that many a nation has tried to take them over. They, they, they've been in war where they've been able to see what their walls can do. So in, uh, in other words, in order for the believer to truly function, in order for the believer to truly bring about this praise and glory that Peter talked about, you got to have seen it yourself. In order for you to testify about it, you have to have enemies come in like a flood and then see the standard raised up against them. You got to have some adversaries in order for you to see, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In order for you to trust him and understand that, you got to see the walls that he's placed around your life and the walls he's placed around your soul. You got to see the attack come and then the attack get thwarted. So there's a period of time of testing and proving and exposing here. He says the, 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 the time is measured and the time is limited. And, and, and the enemy may want more time, but God has literally said, this is the time. And what he said is, is this, not only is it a limited time, but he says, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown. Now, you know, what's important here is what Jesus says, but also what's important is what he doesn't say. He doesn't, we're at the end of this sermon and there's not one rebuke. There's not one, there's only a promise here. There's, there's not a problem that he speaks of, but there's a promise here. He's got a promise of a crown. He says, be faithful unto death. In other words, become faithful unto death. They have been faithful in their trials. He says, listen, no, no, keep growing. Keep growing to the point where you can even die for the gospel. Listen, that's when you know it's there. Not when you just love life and cling to life and want to make sure you're preserved. But when you're able to take on whatever mission God has actually given. And he says, listen, if you do this, if you're faithful to this, I'm going to make sure you have a crown. Now listen, this is not just a, a, a figurative crown, right? He's saying you're going to have victory. You, you, you go, the, the reality is that he says you're my winners and there will be a trophy. There's going to be a, a reward. Again, to look at this, Christ himself has this crown and he's wearing a crown. So when you begin to look at that and understand that, the reality is, is not only it, it does he have this crown and he's wearing a crown, but he says, you're going to share in that victory with me. You're going, it's going to be manifested in your life and you'll wear a crown as well. But, but get this. He says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. And he that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, the Lord is actually speaking to the, to the church. And, he, and he's got a message for the church. But he says everyone's not going to hear it. Right? Now, now when you begin to look at this, ears are natural. Right? And having ears on a head is a, is a natural feature. If you didn't have them, then you would actually be... In, in an unnatural place. This is where there'll be some injury, some deformity even, that would be there if you didn't have ears. So the Lord is not talking about here the natural ear. He's talking about something else here. He's talking about listening. It's not that we don't have ears. He doesn't come and say, well, I have not supplied ears to everyone because the, you know the, when the sower comes, goes out, it says he, he gave seed to the sower and the sower sowed seed. The sower threw the seed everywhere. So the reality is, this is about people who are intentional about using their ears. He that is listening, let him listening. Now, let him listen. Not those that are just hearing. There are plenty of people that are in the congregation. There are plenty of people that have actually heard it in the natural realm, but never observed it in the spiritual realm. That have heard it 
through their natural ear, but never ingested it spiritually. And you listen, let me tell you this. The Lord puts a premium on listening. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That, that's what Moses said. He says, hear. In Proverbs, it says, happy are those who listen to me. So the reality is, you've got to ask yourself, when was the last time you had a, a spiritual hearing check? When was the last time that you really heard what the Lord was saying? The reality is the Lord says, well, my sheep, they recognize my voice and the, another one they won't follow, even if that voice is a familiar voice, right? So the reality is they are familiar with the, sh with the shepherd's voice. The, you know, many of us are having church but are not having a, a conversation with Christ. Many of us are having the tradition, the culture of church, but are not hearing the warnings that God is giving concerning what's happening. That's why so many believers are crumbling today. That's why so many people are, 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 are really just going through and depressed and they need somebody to get them up because they never heard what the Spirit as he said. The Lord says, and even through his word, he says, listen, trials and tribulations in this world are, are natural. They're going to come. Don't think it's strange, you know, some fiery trial has come upon you. Listen, we look and say, this is crazy. This is the biggest thing that's ever happened. This has happened to me. And the Lord says, listen, don't act like some strange thing has happened. Well, why, it, you know, it's never happened in my family, but I warned you concerning this. I told you that was going to happen. Why don't they like me? Why is this happening? How is the enemy attacking me? But didn't I tell you that the enemy was going to do this and, and did you were you listening to me or were you in there just having a social interaction were you listening as an instructive place were you in a position where you knew i was ordering your steps through my word that i was giving you instruction a word behind your ear saying this is the way and walk ye in it there's so many people that'll walk away and say what a great service and have no idea what was spoken an hour later, that people who love the word of God and love the and, and don't recognize that they're not in love with the word, that they might like the words. They might like the, the, the grammatical acrobatics that they're hearing. They may like the fact that the words sound right, but they never get them in their spirit. So when you begin to look at this, Jesus addresses all these seven churches and, and, he, and he addresses all of them the same way. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Now, our, our eyelids, you know, they close from time to time. But you know, your ears are meant to always be open. And we're missing revelation. We're, we're missing it. We're, we're, we're hearing. It's coming around us and we're hearing but not listening. We're not paying attention. We're not applying it. So it's, it's just like people who are cut up who are hearing how to deal with their wounds and then walk away and let those wounds get infected. And eventually there's parts that have to be cut off. Why? I was in the room, but I really wasn't paying attention to what that person was saying about my wounds. Matter of fact, I might have been thinking about what they were saying philosophically about wounds. I might have dealt with how they felt about medicine, but I never thought they were talking to me. He that has an ear, let him hear. In other words, Jesus, you and I would not be here if you weren't talking to me. You don't talk to me about other folks. You don't come to me and bring issues to me about other people. You're not saying, well, this isn't for you. I'm bypassing this for you. This is for your cousin or for your uncle. No, if you're talking to me, if I'm online right now, I'm not sitting here thinking, oh man, they gonna miss it. I wish they had, you better pay attention because the Lord is saying, I'm telling you what's about to come down the pipe for you. This revelation train is not here for you to tell somebody to get on board and you miss your own trip because the train tracks are moving in the direction of this persecution, whether you hear it or not. The, the only issue will be whether you'll be ready to stand or whether you'll crumble when it comes, whether you'll be ready to wrestle against the very thing that the Lord is saying wrestle with, or will you play around and wrestle with flesh and blood? There are people right now that are hating so many people and don't realize that God is saying, I'm trying your faith. I mean, I've allowed them to turn against you so you can still shine. I'm trying to show you off and here you are showing out. You Here you are 
acting up when I'm, I'm when I'm expecting you to be able to show the very things you talked about. And there's so many people that can talk to talk but can't walk to walk. When God is speaking to Smyrna, he's saying, I'm trusting that when the fire comes and it's going to come, you are in the standing position. You know, isn't it amazing how God is saying, I won't let you be ignorant of any of Satan's devices, but yet we walk around like a bunch of ignoramuses anyway. Then he says, listen, I'm not going to let any of Satan's tricks just creep up upon you. And we still got that home alone look on our faces trying to figure out how did this happen? You're, because you're not reading your word and what you're interpreting in this word is some soft, pippy, long stocking, mamby, pamby, gossip gospel that is not the gospel where the Lord is saying, are you ready? Satan is not playing with you. I know you got a new house. That does not mean that you are insulated from what Satan is trying to do. You are just a believer in a brand new house. You are a believer in a fly car, nice clothes. You are just a believer in a nice clothes. And Satan is not deferred or deterred by your Gucci. He's not stopping by the fact that that's another two rooms in your house. He's still coming to make sure that there's depression in that five bedroom house, that, that you are contemplating killing yourself over what's going on in that nice Maserati, that wearing the nicest clothes that you are still raggedy on the inside. And so that's his plan. But the Lord is saying, I'm warning you now. I'm, not, I'm telling you right now that some of you all are going to lose some things. There's going to be some economic depressions. And I don't want you to think it's because Bob hates you or because these people are jealous of you. No, no, they're being used by Satan to, to, to test you. And the reality is that if you are not able to look and say, the Lord gives, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. If you have to stay in that five bedroom and you can't downsize and still be powerful, that the reality is that if you can't drive three cars and now you're down to one, you don't need to complain. You Listen, you need to be in a praise and glory where people can look at you and then begin to praise God because of you. Do you understand that there's a praise that God has said, there are people that are going to glorify me because of how you handle what you're going through right now. So the Lord says, listen, Faith comes by hearing. And I want you to get this. We need to get our hearing check. He that has an ear, let him hear what the, what the Lord is saying to the church. And here's what he says. He who overcomes. And, and we need to stop right there for just a minute because I think that's really important. He who overcomes. Now, listen, there's a promise here, but there's a promise for overcomers. I need you to understand this and I need you to get this. Believers are overcomers. The Lord is saying we're more than conquerors. Believers are not people who ideologically believe in Jesus Christ. Get that. You have to be an overcomer. You cannot be on the concrete down underneath the ground and call yourself an overcomer. You can't be beat up and beat down by any and everything that comes your way and call yourself the overcomer. You are a cultural Christian. You need to get saved. You need to get yourself together. You Listen, if you're going to be an overcomer, you got to overcome some things. If you're going to be more than a conqueror, then you got to conquer more than the stuff that just the regular average joke and conquer. So the reality is you need to get yourself together and recognize that God is saying, you're, you, this is an identity check. This is an identity exposure. This is not an exposure to God. This is an exposure to you. This is God saying, Smyrna, I'm about to show you off. You're going to see some things in yourself. Listen, some of the, there are folks right now, you know, David said, I was young, but now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. There are some saints right now that are looking back on their lives and are now talking about their life for one reason. They now can see what God was exposing. Man, when I was in this ignorant place, God still kept me. Man, when I was here and thought I would crumble, he didn't let me. You know, when I was over here, I never thought I'd praise God when that happened. But here's what I found out. When I was there, it just came out of me. When this one died, when that one was gone, when I lost these things, I still praise God. So now that they're giving that testimony, they're there and they would do it. They still kept teaching Sunday school. It's now when they look back and they realize, you made me a Smyrna. You made me an overcomer. You use that to expose in me who I am so that when the world came, when people came and said, this is who you are, this is who you are, you're weak, you're this, you gave me a testimony you know, where I can unfurl in front of myself, not showing the world, but showing me. Do you understand that God is saying, the world's going to see you, but Smyrna, I'm talking to you. I, I'm not, listen, I'm not really trying to convince the rest of, of the city of Smyrna. I'm not trying to convince the rest of Asia. I'm not trying to 
convince Rome. I need you to understand that you have my favor, that you have my love, you uh, that literally I'm coming to compliment you and that I want you to see it. So, it, it, you know, when there's a scroll that's rolled out uh, and it's all written on one side, nobody else may be able to see it, but you can see it. Smyrna didn't go down where Rome said, I yield, man, we, you know, I mean, these guys have gotten it. The Jews never gave up and said, oh, wow, I yield. Smyrna, you're so tough. It is God saying, well done. Well done. They never changed you. You may not have made changes in them, but they never changed you. They never altered the gospel in you. They never altered the truth in you. And you were meant to stand. Listen, some people are so depressed because they're not moving the needle in the way they're supposed to. And God says, there's a fortress that I build. And sometimes the only job is to maintain territory in that place. To make sure that no weapon formed against you will ever prosper. That the reality is that you don't, you don't think you've done anything. Where do you think these people that are inside the fortress came from? They came from there. You, listen, and generations from now, where do you think those people, who those people are going to be talking about? They're going to come from there. How many sermons are going to be preached by about you and people are going to come to the altar and get saved? How many people today are going to hear this word about this church that probably lived and died and thought that they were nothing? Literally don't realize that 2,000 years later we're saying you were the only one that stood without a rebuke, that you looked poor, but you were rich, standing is powerful. And, and here's the promise. He says, if you overcome, that, it, you know what that means? That means I'm not deterred. I'm not intimidated. I'm going to overcome the threat of persecution. I'm going to overcome the actuality of persecution. I, I'm going to, if my pro poverty is, is, is in my life, if, if they confiscate my goods, I mean, if there's tribulation, if there's persecution, if there's even death, if I refuse to turn back because of those things, he says, listen, I'm more than a conqueror. I, I will conquer these things. He says, listen, it, that's overcoming. When we understand overcoming, the Lord says, in this world, there's going to be tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. We join with Christ in the victory. He doesn't come and say, be victorious. He says, join me in the victory. I've already overcome it. So now you can praise me in the midst of this. You can glorify even in your tribulation because you realize I've already overcome it. I mean... So if I praise you, then I won't have to go through it. No. Okay, hold up. That's not how it works. Okay, if I worship you and if I glorify you, then the tribulation ceases, right? If I'm thrown, if I'm thrown into the fiery furnace, it won't burn me. Or if I'm like thrown into the lion's den, it won't, like the lions won't eat me. And the Lord will say, N not, not this one. That's, that's not for you. I'm not talking about that for you. I'm saying when you're thrown in the lion's den, some of you all, they're going to they're eat some of you guys. Uh, when you go, if they throw you to the fiery furnace, you won't be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You, your flesh is going to actually burn. And you're going to pray. And I'm not going to come and take you out of it. And you're going to pray and you're, they're going to kill you right there. You're, you're going to be up on the cross and they're going to uh, put pitch on you and they're going to light you on fire. And you're going to ask me for my presence and I'm going to be there, but I won't stop any of the flames. If you can overcome that, I mean, if you can get through, I'm not talking about just the pain, but the knowledge that I'm there, but I'm not going to intervene. That I'm there and you're there and your daughter is there and your son is there and your wife is there and the lions are there and the tigers are there and you're bound and I could, because you know the stories where I could remove the chains. You know the story where I could shut their mouths and I'm telling you, I'm not going to shut their mouths. I'm not going to make it so you're like Samson where you can just break the bonds. I'm not going to allow your praise like Saul and Paul and Silas to, to break the chains, the, the foundation are not going to rock. No, no. The lions are going to come and they're going to eat you piece by piece. The crowd is going to cheer and people are going to see you die and other people behind you who are going to come up next won't see a deliverance. They'll only see this kind of butchery and they're going to come and they're going to get tied up with those bloody chains and they're going to praise me just like you did. And I'm going to expose the true riches that's in Smyrna. But here's what, here's what he says. And this is, this, is, this is the most important. He says, um, 
If you overcome this, you won't be hurt by the second death. He that hath an ear, let him hear what I'm saying to the churches. He that hath an ear, let him remember why you're here. Remember why you are a believer. Remember who you follow and remember the promises of the one you follow. I want you to remember the promises of hatred against you and the promises of persecution against you and the promises of standing for him. And what happens? He says, you will not be touched. You will not be hurt by the second death. Those that overcome will not be hurt by the second death. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's really important because the second death is the third type of death that's actually revealed to us in the scripture, right? We've got, the, we've got the spiritual death, and then we've got physical death, and then we now have this third death, which is uh, this uh, eternal death. Now, and, and what you've got to understand is that uh, the physical death is actually the separation of the physical body from the spirit. That is a temporal death. That's a temporary death. Because that even, even then, there's going to be a day when the body is going to be joined again uh, with the spirit. So, so we understand that, 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 that that's a temporary death, uh, but, but it happens to everyone. It, 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 it's corporal. But there's a spiritual death that is actually corporal. It, it, it is actually, it, it's temporary as well, but it is the way we're all born. We, our spirits are born separated from God. We are physically separated from God. We are born in that, in that place. And unless spiritual death is reversed in this lifetime, it will remain and become eternal death because the third type of death that's mentioned is eternal death, which is complete, utter separation from God. It is irreversible. There is no coming back from that. It is an unending separation from God. Now, listen, it's appointed unto man once to die. So all men die. How do men die? Well, all men die by hunt. Thousands of ways. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we could probably have there's probably 20,000, 30,000 ways you can die. So how, how, how many people, how, how do men die? They, they die a lot of ways. But all men die and they're killed by a lot of ways. But none in the natural realm are killed by death. Death is the instrument of the death. And I want you to get that. The second death is absolutely different. It's an eternal death. It's a, it's, it's a completely different death. And believers aren't affected by this death. This eternal death, this eternal separation is now a state where nothing in the spiritual death has occurred. Nothing and in this lifetime has occurred. And when that doesn't happen, when that's not reversed, when the person is not reborn or born again, then they will now instantly upon their physical death enter into a, a constant state of this spiritual death. They'll be killed by death. They'll die by death. Some people say, well, listen, I'll die by a heart attack. This person will be dead by death. Death in and of itself will be thrown into the lake of fire. And at that very moment, that's the moment where, the, where, where eternal death happens. I want to read something to you. It says, blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. There is this opportunity for resurrection, literally to escape the clinches of death. It says the second death, they have is no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Get this. You know, one thing that Paul says, he, you know, he asks this question, he says, oh, death, where is your sting? Now, you know, if you were to look at a scorpion, you know, a scorpion can grab you by the pincers, right? And like, if, if you had, a, if there was a, you know, scary movie, and there's a giant scorpion, he comes and he grabs you by the pincers and it, and, it, and it cuts you in half, right? That person will die. That's not the plan, though, of death. Death, the scorpion actually plans to kill you with the use of his stinger. There's meant to be now a continuous place here. And so when you look at this, Paul comes and says, oh, death, where's your sting? What you intended was that I would die eternally, that I would be in the same state of emptiness, nothingness, desolation, despair forever. There is a temporary place of death. You know, the Lord even says, you know what? I, I rejoice at the death of my saints. Why? Because despair, sickness, disease, 
has a temporary lease. Do you understand that it wants to be permanent? That the reality is that decay wants to be permanent. There is a victory over death in that even the body that decays cannot decay even permanently. And death, true death, has a design and a desire for permanence. It wants to keep you in that place of death. So the reality is the Lord says there's victory over death. That there's victory snatched out of the hands of death. Keys are given to the kingdom. And so when you begin to look at this lake of fire, this ending judgment, it says, and death and Hades, death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. The second death is reserved for unbelievers. And listen, I'm going to close out here. And I, I think this is really important. Uh, for us to really, really get. And I want you to really get this. I'm not going to end with any music today. I'm not going to, you know, listen, I don't want there to be any theatrics. I want you to recognize here that there is a place of hope that we live in right now. But the Bible says those, the, the, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, those are the ones who are going to, who are going to receive the second death. I want you to, I want you to get that. Simply not having the, your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that person is, is literally asking for the second death. And when that person has experienced a second death, it's an experience that happens eternally. That that person dies forever. I'm not talking about dying. I'm not talking about dying. I'm talking about that person dies forever. And to be dead from the spiritual perspective is to absolutely be separated from God. And there's you have no idea what it is like to be separated from the one who gives life. You have no idea to what it's like to be separated from light. There are people who get glimpses of that here. A glimpse of it. Insanity is a glimpse of that. Not to be in your right mind. Not to feel like people care. Depression is a glimpse of that. Hopelessness is a glimpse of that. Abject poverty is a glimpse of that. That's what the enemy wants for us. That's what the enemy wants for you. But the Lord comes with this letter for one purpose. I came that you might have life. And that more abundantly. That's what this word is about right now. The word today is about hope. There's a warning in this word. There's a seriousness that has to be dealt with in this word. We've got to look at ourselves. And listen, one of the real serious places that we've got to really deal with is what's a believer and why am I calling myself a believer? If you're not a soldier in the army of the Lord, if you're not able and willing to be called upon for any mission that he deems uh, 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 favorable for you. And if you're not willing to suffer for Christ, you have to question whether you're a believer or whether you really are just a church goal, whether this is social or cultural. And I really want you to really take a look at that today because there's going to be a need for soldiers in this last day. They're going, there's going to be a need for people who know how to war, even in the spiritual realm today. There are going to be people who know how to stand and are, and are not caught up in self-preservation. But, but understand the reason they were born, which is to bring praise and glory to God, whose ways are not like our ways. And sometimes suffering does that. Sometimes standing simply is what we're required to do. And I want you to understand, there are things that you're not going to be able to do in this world, that the changes you're not going to be able to make, but there's a requirement that God has called for you. There, there is not a requirement in your life where, where Christ has come and says, you've got to change your environment. You've got to change your nation. You've got to change your workplace. No, that's not the requirement. And that's a blessing when it happens. If, if we're blessed to do that, if we're called, if, if, if the Lord allows us to be people who will change our whole workplace, our whole community environments, that's awesome. But you know what the Lord has called us to do? Well, what's actually there? Stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. I need to see you standing today. I need you looking at the ground that you stand and hold that ground. And we are in a time right now where the Antichrist spirit is reigning. And the reality is that there's some areas where you're not going to be able to attack and make inroads. But what you've got to determine is that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Listen, this is the territory I have. I'm standing and I'm going to be loud. And I promise you this. If you stand and other people stand and they light their torches in the air for Christ, you'll find out that the Lord says, 
I've got thousands that have never bowed a knee. I've got believers out here that were just waiting for a signal. You be the signal today. Lift up your torch. You decide, for God I live and for God I die. I'm not just living for Christ, but I'm willing to give up this temporal body because he's given me this promise that if I operate as the overcomer that I am. I want you to understand this. This was not prophecy. He was saying, you're going to overcome. And let me give you, let me tell you the promise that I'm giving to overcomers. And I'm talking to you. And you need to grab hold of that right now. That when I'm talking about overcomers, you wouldn't be in the meeting today if it wasn't about you. He's not bringing you in here and trying to pump you up and to encourage you. He's trying to let you know who you are. You are an overcomer. And I want you to receive that today. I want you to understand what comes with being an overcomer, but I want you to understand it's who God has called you to be. He's called you to be an overcomer. He said that's who you are. And I want you to receive that today. And listen, if you're listening to me and you, you've never received Christ today, I want you to receive him in your heart today. I want you to simply ask the Lord, Lord, come into my life. Make me that overcomer. Allow me to be someone who will stand for you. Teach me your ways. And I want you to understand this. It's really as simple as that. That there's no huge ceremony that your life is changing even right now if you've made that declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen, he died on the cross for you, but he also got up for you. He got up so that you would also get up. You have a cross to bear. You have a resurrection to have, to experience. Smyrna was experiencing right now when the Lord says, I promise you, there's a resurrection in store for you. And pain and suffering does not dull who you are shine in the midst of it. That's the word for today. Shine in the midst of it. Shake off depression. Shake, shake off low self-esteem. Shake off pain today. And just decide, even if it's for just a moment where you are, to shine. If you're laying in the bed and you can't get up, just lift up your hand. Lift up a finger. Lift up an eyebrow. You know, move a pillow. Do something to simply say, God, I'm just lifting up my torch, saying I'm one of those thousands. They may not know me, but I'm here. And I promise you, all over the world, there are people who are hearing that are lifting up the light so that we others can see this light and continue to stand as overcomers as we've been called to. Listen, I'm going to have a word of prayer with you today. And then I want to release you to have an awesome, awesome, powerful, powerful day. Please don't forget to share this message. And let's and receive this prayer. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you right now for the, the encouragement that you've given. But we also thank you right now for the reality check that you've told us, God, that the world that we're living in and, and that we have an adversary, an enemy. And no matter how prosperous we may be now, no matter what good things are happening now, God, we know that in our time and even in generations to come, that the enemy is going to persecute the church. But you promised that upon this rock, you've also built your church. And you said the gates of hell should not prevail against it. But God, we just thank you right now that you've given us standing power. You've given us an example in your word that there is a church. There are people that will stand for you. That in the midst of poverty, in the midst of persecution and tribulations, and in the difficulty of work, they will still work for you. They'll still stand for you. They'll still lift up the bloodstained banner. And God, you have given them precious promises. And we receive those promises right now that we are overcomers. And that because we are overcomers, that the second death will not touch us, that you have a crown that you're going to give us. And we look past what we go through now and look toward that mark of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. God, we thank you right now for all that you've done. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, uh, I want you to have an awesome, awesome Sunday today. Uh, and, I, and my prayer is that you are blessed by this word. My prayer is that, you know, you receive the seed in your spirit today. And if the Lord has even has touched you to sow seed, I want to certainly thank you and take a, take this time to pray over the seed for all of those that have, that have sown seed that are going to sow seed today. Because your seeds are extremely important because it's a part of your worship. And I want to make sure it's not a separate area. I want to pray over your seed today. Those that are going to sow seed, I want to pray over your seed. I want to pray over your seed and wherever you sow it. When you sow seed here, I'm praying because I believe and I know this is good ground. But listen, when you make investments in your life, when you decide to do what you're going to do with your cars and when you, what school your children are going to go through, those are seeds that you're planting. 
And I want to pray over your seed, not only just today, but your seed from henceforth and forever. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you right now for those seed sowers. God, we thank you right now for those that are sowing seed in every area of their life. God, we know that the enemy tries to come through finances to bring about depression. God, to change our attitudes concerning you, to take away our generosity. God, even to, to cocoon us and to, to bring us into places of low self-esteem. But God, I just thank you right now that our riches and our wealth is in you. And for those that have it to give, God, we just thank you right now for those. But God, even for those that wish they had it, for those that don't have it and and or just thinking about daily bread. God, I just pray right now that you would send sowers to them, that they that sowers would come and sow directly into their lives. That God, that this is not just about giving into a ministry or giving to a church, but it's about doing ministry. And giving is a part of ministry. So God, meet those needs. And we just know right now that you said that you would cause men to give into our bosom. So God, I'm just thanking you that you're stirring up men to begin to fund the very things that you place in the hearts of your people. Businesses that you've given them, ministries that you've given them. Them, enterprises. God, all manner of witty invention. God, I thank you right now for the wealth of ideas, but also the people that are going to come to help them to do what they're called to do. So God, we just thank you right now for your great generosity and giving us your son. And even for this day that you've given us, we bless you. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Listen, Revelation train has reached the end of the tracks today. We'll be back here Thursday uh, at 730. But listen, if you want to hear more, if you want to see, get, get, get a little bit more information, want to know a little bit more about us, I want you to go to disciplesoffaith.life. Check out our website. It'll give you a little bit of insight about our ministry. It'll tell you a little bit about who we are, about the origins of this ministry, why we even started Disciples of Faith Global Outreach, and ways that you can support the ministry, ways that you can be a part of the ministry, ways that you can help further and grow the gospel ministry. We just thank God for each and every one that's connected and for all of you all that decided to come on in and to join us. I hope you had a good ride today. We'll be back Thursday at 730, right on this very same place. And I hope that you have an awesome day. Don't forget to share. God bless you.